They're the Vikings for hire. Ruthless mercenaries who strike fear into the enemy. This is Dark Age warfare at the most brutal. Axe, sword, shield, spear. They're the elite special forces in service to a foreign ruler. Conquering unruly territories across the great Byzantine Empire. They're known as the Varangian Guard. But it's one particular man who will solidify their place in history. Harold Hadrada is the prototypical Viking of the era. He will develop tactics which will transform warfare across the Mediterranean. Nobody really in their right mind wanted to storm a city wall. It was usually doomed to failure. Hadrada's string of victories will show the Varangian Guard to be one of the most exceptional special forces of all times. thousand years after the birth of Christ, the Byzantine Empire is now the biggest, the richest, and the best organized state in Europe. It stretches from Italy in the west, across Greece and the Balkans, all the way to Asia Minor in the east. At its head is the emperor, Basil II the most powerful man in the world. But Basil's empire is under threat. Like all empires, and I suppose like all politicians, you really have to watch your, your back. There's a series of very important revolts against his legitimacy. What Basil needs is a crack troop of warriors who can suppress the internal revolts and guarantee the security of his empire. So he makes a deal. He sells his sister to the Grand Prince of Kiev in Ukraine, Vladimir the Great. Vladimir is descended from Swedish Vikings and rules what are called the Rus. Vladimir the Great was a disgusting warrior. He was the prototypical Viking. He epitomized everything that was just nasty in the individual. He took 800 concubines, he had dozens of wives. He performed human sacrifice just at a whim to intimidate his aggressors. I mean, there was nothing redeeming about this man. In return for his sister, Basil gets precisely what he needs. 6,000 of the most fearsome warriors on the planet. They will become known as the Varangian Guard. The finest special forces in late antiquity. Originally Vikings from Scandinavia, their ancestors had built a reputation that spread right across Europe to the ears of the emperor himself. Most of them would have been the same kind of people who were creating mayhem around in Western Europe. When we talk about the Vikings, we almost always think about the attacks on England and the Vikings crossing the North Sea. For some 200 years, Vikings had been terrorizing Northern and Western Europe, becoming notorious for chasing wealth and their insatiable appetite for violence. The men of Scandinavia are tough. You know, they are tattooed, they're macho, they're red-blooded. 
We were ruthless warriors who would stop at nothing to, to slaughter their opponents. But not all of them go raiding across northern and western Europe. The smart Vikings didn't head west. They headed east. What lures them is the prospect of making vast amounts of money by traveling down the vast rivers of modern-day Russia. Those river systems, they're like arteries bringing talent from Scandinavia down towards Russia, looking for service. They can sell themselves as soldiers of fortune, mercenaries to the mighty warlords of the region. Like the Vikings who've wreaked havoc across much of Europe, they come with a fearsome array of weapons. Their weapon of choice was a long axe, which in reality resembled more of a meat cleaver than an actual axe. The famous Dane axe, which has a single blade up to a foot long that could sever a man's head in a single blow. This was a lethal weapon. They also used the viciously effective double-edged sword. And the spear. The spear is uh, very easy to carry, it doesn't weigh much. It's very cheap to make and very fast to make, so it would be uh, an excellent weapon. As a Viking weapons expert, Martin Holtman knows all about the advantages of using a spear in battle. The spear was very useful. You could use it behind the shield, like holding the shield yourself, and you could try and, and stab after his leg or his head. I could have no shield, and uh, if he was my friend, I could stand behind the lines, and he was covering me. I was having this long spear, I could just stab the people. And move around, stab, move around, stab behind the lines. We actually one uh, would have like a stopper down here, so when you push it into another person, you could, it wouldn't go all the way through, you could, you could easily pull it out again. And then keep on fighting. These Viking Rus become known as the Varangians. They earn that nickname because they famously stick together. Verar is an old Norse word which means uh, probably some sort of companionship and it's a sort of community of people with common interests. The people who look after each other's backs. It's a very brutal male macho world of, of high achievers. These are men who have their eyes set on prestige and on riches. But for these men, Serving in the cold, harsh lands of Ukraine isn't enough. To this close-knit set of mercenaries, the prospect of serving the wealthiest man in the world, Basil II, is irresistible. In Constantinople, they have the opportunity to gain riches beyond their wildest imagination. So the Varangians enter the emperor's service as his elite fighting unit. And begin by crushing his internal revolts. He had the basic problem with a, a rebellion against him, uh, led by a man called Vardas Phokas, who had claimed the throne, set himself up as emperor, and his own Greek bodyguard had gone over onto his side. So he needed some troops he could rely on in order to put down this internal rebellion. 
In a matter of months, Basil is able to knock out uh, his last remaining rivals. For Basil, it's a short-term win. Having helped Basil secure the wider empire, the Varangian guard are given the next task, to deal with the imperial capital. Today's Istanbul, Constantinople, situated on the Bosphorus, where the continents of Europe and Asia meet, is a mighty trading post. But in the 11th century, its magnificence is without equal. Constantinople is the most impressive and beautiful and significant city in the Mediterranean. It's a sensational, it's a jewel of a city. It's got these churches of an enormous scale and beauty. From the year 500 until 1500, it's the biggest city in Europe. In terms of Christian European cities, it's completely unparalleled. In terms of its size, a population of half a million people. If you were thinking in terms of English cities in the same period, maybe London might possibly have had 10,000 people in it. It's a melting pot of people, of languages, of noises. But Constantinople is also a dangerous place, particularly for an emperor. We don't talk about Byzantine politics for nothing. The Byzantine Empire is legendary for its sort of devious plotting. While pleasantly chaotic and colorful on the outside, beneath that veneer, the city was a labyrinth of political power shifts and maneuvers that made everyone suspicious of everyone else. Those who are finding the emperor's favor and quickly attract jealousy. Those who feel that they should be getting more for what they're doing uh, find themselves sitting in dark, dark taverns plotting about what they can do next. Everyone's doing deals, keeping their friends closer, their enemies twice as close. It is, above all, to avoid the nasty fate of several of his predecessors that Basil needs the Varangian guard. Byzantine emperors quite often finish up getting murdered and overthrown. So the Varangian Guard become Basil II's close protection team. They're charged with guarding all the major public buildings and are always stationed at the Emperor's imperial palaces. And they accompany him when he attends church and other formal occasions. They stand around the Emperor. They can form a ring around him and sort of move him through the palace, like a cordon of special services that will go around our leaders today, around the President of America. But the Varangian Guard have another more sinister task. They are the Emperor's assassins. They're the people that the Emperor will send to deal with suspected traitors. They also get to do the nasty stuff. They become Basil's secret police in charge of arresting suspected criminals and political enemies. Those posted at Constantinople's grim Numera prison quickly win a reputation for astonishing savagery. There is many cases of intimidation and torture. A common thing was cut off the nose or cut off the ear. There's even cases of them taking human excrement and, and putting it in the criminal's eyes and nose and mouth. Blindings are a particular Varangian favorite. 
It's not thought that they actually physically put eyes out by poking things into them or, or hooking eyes out. It's, it's thought that they actually used acid. And they used it to scar the cornea. So that people were, in a sense, functionally blinded by it, but not not 100% blind. They could probably still tell the difference between night and day. Castration was, was quite a popular Byzantine punishment. So no doubt if that had to be done, they would probably be the guys who would uh, get the old shears out. <laughs> When they're not doing the Emperor's dirty work, around Constantinople, the Varangian Guard enjoy the good life. There's plenty of things to keep young, virile Vikings occupied around town. Constantinople itself had plenty of entertainment. The chariot racing was, was, was the most popular of all, of all the activities. I suppose a bit like uh, professional footballers. Women. Booze. <laughs> For men raised in the cold, harsh lands of Scandinavia and Russia, it's like paradise. I don't think we can really imagine the culture shock that these Norsemen, these Vikings from snow-covered lands would have experienced when they first set foot in Constantinople. Keep in mind, these people lived in huts. Now they come to a lush, tropical climate and much to their delight, an endless supply of fine wines. To the Byzantine aristocratic elite, the loutish behavior of the Imperial Guard is shocking. The Varangians' hard drinking and debauchery earns them the nickname, the Emperor's Wineskins. The guard were looked at suspiciously by the local common people in Constantinople, and you can't blame them. They were drunk 24-7. I mean, they were rowdy. There's a famous historian and poet who was put in prison, and he writes a poem about the fact that he can't sleep at night, every night, because these guys are screaming and yelling and causing incredible ruckus. That behavior could explain why even today a bizarre piece of Viking graffiti can still be seen etched on a balustrade inside the Hagia Sophia, the greatest cathedral of its age. I suppose we do know that sort of like football hooligans on tour, you know, if you had enough, enough to drink and you're somewhere that you want to leave your mark, chiseling something into the side of a wall, you know, it's a way of showing you're there and showing off to your mates that you, you've done it. The inscription reads, Halfdan was here. He could have inscribed his mark anywhere, so why choose to do it in the great cathedral? And I suppose it's showing, if I'm going to prove I've been anywhere, it's there. Basil II's Varangian guard may be causing mayhem around Constantinople, but he has another task for them. Now he's stabilized the empire. He wants to expand it. The Varangian Guard are incorporated into the main Byzantine army. They're divided into companies of 500. Each company is placed under the command of a regular officer called the Akulathos. It means the Varangians, unlike the typical Vikings, have to learn discipline. The Varangians have to be very organized, very aggressive, but still be able to follow orders. But there's another key difference in how they're used. Where most Vikings are used to charging headlong into battle, the emperor uses his Varangians in a different way. He holds them in reserve. They would have hoped that by taking a position further back, that they would then be able to exercise some sort of control and command during the course of the battle and, and come up with tactics which would actually, actually respond to the enemy movements. 
only when the fight gets to its fiercest does the Emperor commit his shock troops. They start by banging their shields. Then they charge. What we do pick up about the Varangians consistently is they're incredibly brave in battle. So they never give ground, that they always fight for each other, and their intensity um, is, is huge, that they just carry on fighting. They let their swords drip with blood and they will keep fighting until the very, very end. The Varangians aren't just fierce. They are tactical. Key to their success is the use of the shield wall. This was essentially shields interlocked. It could be used as an, a defensive against cavalry, archers, infantry. You have to imagine that, that several people were standing like this and they were interlocking the shields like this. This way, it was a very, very strong formation and you could actually move forward like this. But the Varangian Guard's shield wall is about more than protection. They deploy a unique Viking tactic to pierce enemy defenses. the boar snout. If you were to break a shield wall, you would create a formation like a wedge, something like that, and you would have the strongest people in front. By placing one of their biggest and fiercest warriors at the wall's center, and then charging at an opponent's shield wall, sheer weight and momentum not only pierces the enemy lines, it also spreads panic through their ranks. They were probably bigger, they had very heavy weapons, so if you ran in with big axes, cutting through the enemy lines, then you could create an opening. Under the banner of Emperor Basil II, success follows success for the Varangian Guard. It has often been suggested that Basil II's reign is really the Golden Age, and that is in no small part due to the Guard. He keeps his army busy, pushing the frontiers as sort of like, like ripples constantly outwards. They fight gallantly and gloriously for their emperor, and are at the forefront of a string of victories in Syria, Georgia, Armenia, Bulgaria, Greece, Macedonia, and southern Italy, not only quashing unruly factions of the empire, but increasing its influence far and wide. Varangians are described in the Norse literature as being incredibly important. the ones who hold the empire together. They are achieving all the battles, left, right, and center. Victory makes the Varangian guard very rich men. You would be paid between 17,000 and about 32,000 pounds a year. If our Varangian had wanted to have a, a, a nice, pretty, young, virgin slave girl all for himself, he could have gone down to the slave market and bought one for about £360. So even the basic lowest estimate of their pay has got absolutely enormous purchasing power in Constantinople. On top of their monthly wage, the Varangian Guard receive regular bonuses and a third of all battle spoils. And there are even more perks. 
your food's all in, you've got all your weapons provided and the very best quality weapons because the Emperor wants you to look magnificent. of the 11th century, more and more Viking mercenaries are ready to join the club. The success they had proved to be the greatest recruitment vehicle they could ever ask for. The young men of Scandinavia that heading for Constantinople was almost like a sort of quite a glamorous gap year where you'd go and earn your spurs, you'd go and see the world, you'd be exposed to sights and sounds that you'd never seen before, you'd be able to be a military tough type and show off your tattoos and your, your prowess. The basic idea is if you're loyal, if you're good, you can, you can, you can earn your keep and you can rise up through the system. Amongst those who make their way from Russia is a Viking warrior who will take the Varangian Guard to a whole new level. Towering over six feet tall, the muscular young man with his long, fair hair cuts a striking figure. His name is Harold Hadrada. Harold Hadrada is the prototypical Viking of the era. He is a rock star. He's the pinup boy of the Varangian period. Hadrada has been fighting since the age of 15 when he witnessed the death of his brother, King Olaf, at the hands of insurgents in Norway. Olaf is actually killed in the battle by the rebels, and Harold actually sees this. It's not just his half-brother, the king, it's also the man who he looks up to. So this is ingrained in his memory. That battle changes his life. Exiled from Norway, Harold escapes to Sweden and travels on to the safe haven of Kiev, the home of the Viking Rus. There, he's recruited as a mercenary by Kiev's new ruler, Prince Yaroslav I, the son of Vladimir the Great. And he quickly proves himself. He finds his skills and his service highly valued by Yaroslav, who identifies in Harold a brave, highly capable, well-connected and ambitious man who has a chip on his shoulder. He's a man who really feels the grievances of having been excluded from power by men who he thinks are less worthy than he is. But eventually, he cannot resist the riches on offer in the Byzantine Empire. As a man with royal blood, you had charisma, uh, and people would have followed him just because of that. So he, he would have been able to go down to, to Constantinople with, with a, the beginnings already of an armed following. But Harold's not only going to Constantinople for the money. He has never forgotten that he is a Viking prince. 
His plan one day is to return to Norway at the head of a huge army to win back his crown. So around 1033 AD, Harold and his men embark on the year-long voyage down the Russian river systems with the aim of entering the Emperor's Guard. They arrive at just the right time. Basil II has died, and he's been replaced by his niece, Empress Zoe, and her husband, Michael IV. The new rulers are under pressure and need to establish their authority. Harold is just what they need. He's reliable, he is effective, he gets things done, he's smart, and he's a good one to have on your side. He's so much better than the rest. And he has practice. He participated in the most brutal battles. So he, he learned what was necessary to win, which was maiming, torturing, creating alliances and truces, and then breaking them. He would do whatever it took to be victorious. Fighting in the Varangian Guard across the empire, Harold makes his mark. But Zoe and Mike Roblin is the need to do more to hold the empire together. Compared to Basil II, they're just drinking water. If they're to silence the debtors, they need to achieve greatness. That means expanding the empire. So Michael sets his sights on the west, Sicily. The objective of Sicily is to regain the western provinces for the Byzantine Empire. For centuries, Sicily had been under Byzantine rule. Sicily is the wheel on which the Mediterranean turns. It's a great meeting point between the Islamic and the Greek and the Latin world. It controls the approaches to the east and the west of the Mediterranean, and it's a hugely important trading area. But now the island is in Arab hands. Sicily is very strategically important. It must be captured. If you want to control shipping in the Western Mediterranean, Sicily is key. And for the Byzantine, trade is key. And also as well for the prestige of the empire. It's better to be conquering and capturing rather than being defeated and losing. Harold lands there and discovers the Arabs are prepared. Knowing how effective the Varangians are on the battlefield, they've come up with a plan. They've withdrawn behind strong fortifications. From a military point of view, this is a very hard place to conquer. The cities are well established, well fortified, big walls, ditches in many cases, and a citadel that can hold out for, for a long time. In the Middle Ages, people built walls because they worked. Castles, fortified towns, actually were rarely taken. In terms of battle strategy, the Arabs have the upper hand. In an age before gunpowder or the cannon, all the advantages are for the defender. So an attacker has to either sit down and hope for a long, drawn-out siege, to disease maybe to spread or the city to run out of supplies. Nobody really in their right mind wanted to storm a city wall with people up there chucking boulders and pouring boiling water and throwing spears and things at you. It was absolutely fraught with, with risks and almost usually doomed to failure.
This situation presents Harold with a massive problem. Classic Varangian tactics, like the boar snout, are no use against a solid wall. He has to devise something new. It's the kind of test familiar to special forces today. The ability to improvise and use whatever the surroundings and the circumstances are available to you. The ability to again lateral think and think of a plan to be creative is absolutely essential. Harold starts to wonder what the Arabs may have overlooked. What might their weaknesses be? And then, as he observes one fortified town, it hits him. If he can't get over the walls, he can go under them. Harold actually develops the idea to dig a tunnel under the walls and into the city. Out of the view of the town's walls, Harold chooses a spot close to a river and his Varangian guard get to work. It, rather than having big heaps of soil lying around which would give the game away, they scattered it into a stream so the stream washed it away to destroy all the evidence. At the crucial moment when Harold believes that the tunnel is now within the city walls, he waits. There's a lull. What the Varangians are waiting for is the perfect moment to catch their enemy unawares. In this case, it's dinner. You have all the, the local Saracens eating and drinking and just doing what they do all the time because they know that these people can never penetrate their castle. According to Harold's Norse saga, while the Arabs are enjoying their evening meal, he and his men emerge through the limestone floor of the great banqueting hall. The Varangians go to do their deadly work. <laughs> Defenders are completely shocked. These uninvited wolves have now entered their city. They just start slaughtering these people. It was over. And the city was theirs. It's one of a string of astonishing victories. Faced with another fortification, Harold's methods are even more cunning. This time, he borrows an idea from the ancient Greeks. One of the tales really resembles a, the famous Trojan horse story. He created the impression that something is not what it seems. In other words, he created the impression that he was dying. Harold faints illness. places his tent further away from the main Byzantine camp so the defenders of the city can see. To and fro, soldiers go in to the tent. Now, this game Harold's plan works quite well. The Arab defenders, confused as to why no attacks have been made on their city, even send their own spies out to investigate. They learn that Harold is dead. A delegation of Varangians is then sent to the city to make an astonishing request. The citizens are told, this is important now for us to bury our leader in style, and we'd like him to be buried in your church, and we'll pay you handsomely if you do so. To the Arabs in the fort, the chance to have such a famous soldier buried within their walls is both an honor and irresistible.
the Varangians transport the coffin under a religious ceremony with priests and other people from the city. According to the sagas, uh, the gates are opened and uh, pallbearers solemnly come in, walking slowly. They put the coffin on the floor and jam the gates open with it. At that crucial moment, Harold springs his trap. The Varangian guardsmen pull out their weapons from under their ceremonial clothing. They sound the call to arms. All hell breaks loose. The Vikings absolutely destroy everyone. It turns into a massacre. But it's at another fortified town where Harold comes up with the most ingenious plot of all. Harold's laid siege to the town with no luck. Once again, he faces a heavily defended fort with thick and very high stone walls. Worse, the Arab enemy are well supplied. There's no chance of starving them out. Harold, once again, needs to use brains rather than brawn. He just sits for days and observes. Any intelligence you can garner to, you know, assist any assault is, you know, it's essential. He just watches the village, looking for inspiration as to how he can conquer it. You know, any good surveillance or reconnaissance is always looking for weaknesses or strongly established routines. Harold notices two things. The homes within the town's walls have roofs made of thatch. Second, that birds are nesting in the house's eaves. He observes that sparrows every day are flying from the thatched roofs in the village into the fields and back again in the evening. He comes up with a plan as creative as it is cruel. He orders his men to capture as many birds as possible. When they're captured, small splinters of wood are attached to the backs of the birds and then smeared with tar. Harold then sets alight the splinters of wood and releases the birds. Burning, the birds fly back inside the walls to their nests in the straw eaves. It's a brilliant strategy, and it works. Before long, the homes inside are ablaze. Just as Harold had planned, the Arab inhabitants come pouring out and give up without a fight. The defenders obviously panic-stricken. With their entire city and the walls on fire, and actually surrender to the Varangians. Harold, magnanimous in victory, apparently spares the lives of the townspeople. Sicily is a great triumph for Harold and his Varangians. They prove themselves to be more than axe-wielding thugs, 
they have become master tacticians as well. Harold's success is the high point for the Varangian Guard and places them among the finest special forces of their age. But after nine eventful years of service, Harold's career doesn't end well. He's imprisoned for embezzling imperial riches. Harold eventually escapes Constantinople for Kiev, and then Norway, where he becomes king in 1046. But winning back Norway is not enough. 20 years later, in 1066, Harold Hadrada is killed, trying to claim the English throne at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Without Harold Hadrada, the Varangian Guard continues to fight, but never reaches the same heights. They do enjoy many victories in the years to come, but the advent of heavy cavalry means their tactics will become outmoded. By the 14th century, the Emperor's once crack band of invincibles become nothing more than a ceremonial troop. However, it's those glory years under Harold Hadrada and Basil II that have ensured that the Varangian Guard are remembered as one of the most devastating and successful special forces in history. There is something, I think, that shines out of enterprise and adventure in these people leaving their home so far away in the north. These Varangians are pioneers. You know, they're explorers. They're men who open up horizons. The guard will not be remembered as just mere mercenaries, but rather a noble tradition of warriors who combine brains with brawn and pride and a desire to do whatever it takes to be victorious.